All right, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Open your Bible to the book of Acts. And find chapter 26. We're going to look at that passage one more time. Acts chapter number 26. We'll begin our reading at uh, verse 12 tonight. Acts 26, beginning at verse 12, the Bible says, Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, <clears throat> at midday, O king, he's talking to Agrippa, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking and giving his testimony. At midday, O king, verse 13, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And, we were, and when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple, and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying, None other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Amen, Amen indeed. Father, we praise you <coughs> and ask you now for the very special favor of eyes that see and ears that hear. Lord, I'm ever mindful of that need that my understanding be opened. I acknowledge, Lord God, that I need you to guide me to truth. I need you to show me and to reveal to me your mind and your heart. Let me tell you, Father in heaven, I desperately need you to show your mind and your heart to me. And I ask you, Father, to give us that blessing tonight. And I'm asking you for it in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. <coughs> All right. Well, this is going to wrap up our gap conference, gap number five. I heard somebody already talking about gap number six. I'll just keep gapping with you as long as you want to do it. We'll just keep, you know, keep on with this thing. But uh, as God is my witness, every one of them, I think, well, this might be the last one. Not because I want it to be the last one. It's just I figure, you know, but anyway, hey, it's been fun. Amen. Yeah, amen. We've gotten some good work done, I think. Sure. I haven't had a chance to listen to them. When I listen to them, I'll probably get sick. <laughs> <laughs> how many of you guys, you preachers, how many, you, how many of you really have a hard time listening to yourself preach? <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm one of those. It's hard. I listen along, oh. and then oh, I gotta listen to this and I turn it back on. Oh. <laughs> so I oh boy. But anyway, I sure hope you don't feel that way when I preach. Oh man. This might be a longer night than I thought it was gonna be. Uh, the question I often get when I'm preaching and teaching on this subject, the role of repentance in preaching and in personal evangelism, is this what does it look like in practice? <clears throat> I mean, all this talk about repentance, okay, but what does that look like? So let's jump right into the message. What does it look like? First, I want to give you a few comments, make a few comments on the issue of evangelizing children. Some very good things were said this afternoon with regard to that important question. And it is one of the things that 
come up a lot. You start describing repentance in, these, in this language that sounds like this. It's huge and big, and, and the question becomes, how do I communicate that to a child? You know, really hasn't done much. I mean, they haven't been, uh, well, they haven't gone out there and committed murder, and they haven't uh, stolen any cars yet, and they haven't uh, taken any drugs yet. And I brought out, yes, they have. Anybody's ever visited a nursery for half an hour or even 10 minutes, you know. You get Grand Theft Auto is going to happen any minute now. One kid grabs the other guy's car, you know, amen. That is the sin of Grand Theft Auto. I mean, it isn't the crime of Grand Theft Auto, but it is the sin of stealing. Now, they don't understand that yet. They're children, I get that, but they are sinners. One of them going to commit murder before too long. They're going to hate that other kid and go over there and scratch his eyes out or something. You got to watch them, amen? You don't, you don't pay attention to them. We might lose one in there. I mean, it's a dangerous place. I'm kidding around, of course, but I'm making the point I hope you get that these children are sinners. They were born lying. So when do we start evangelizing? When they start showing that they are recognizing that they're sinners. They start showing that. They, they, there's, their conscience begins to wake up. They begin to uh, take on uh, symptoms of guilt and shame and remorse. And things like this begin to develop in their heart and their life. And the thing that was said over and over again that I thought was really good is that we watch them. We put the gospel in front of them consistently, faithfully, truthfully, honestly. And don't be afraid to teach them. These little minds learn how to talk. And you don't even have to do anything to make that happen. They're all of a sudden going da da ma ma, and pretty soon they're saying supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? They they learned that their minds can take on a whole lot more information than you realize that they can. So we need to obviously you're not going to talk to them about the Holy Trinity and, and Amen, and you're not going to try to bury them and all that kind of stuff. But to be honest with you, you could even teach them concepts like that. The ability of the mind of a little child to receive truth is just amazing. And they're so ready to believe you. They don't have a lot of stuff in their way. So teach them the truth. Teach them, teach them what they need to know and watch them. Jesus said, suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Whenever they tried to get in the way of the children coming to Jesus, he got offended with them. Jesus Christ uses the children as an illustration of, of what is required of all of us to come to him. Wait a minute, that's a little bit backwards. Jesus puts a child in front of us and says, you need to learn something from this child about how to come to me. We think the child has a hard time coming to Jesus. We can learn something from the child about how to come to Jesus. They come with simple, uncomplicated faith. They come with the, the ability and the willingness to just throw their heart at you. That's the way a little child is. And we need to understand that. I also understand, of course, that they can understand and know that they're sinners. And until they do understand and know they're sinners, they, they're not going to get saved. Right. So it's a dangerous thing to take a little child and, and uh, you know, encourage him to say a prayer and, and then start reinforcing that throughout the rest of his life. Amen. They, start getting, they start waking up and think, oh, no, you took care of that when you were five, remember? And we just keep reinforcing that narrative in their life. That's a, that's a dangerous thing to do. Uh, you need to let that open up in their own heart, and their own mind, and as they respond, you respond. Amen? And you can bring them to Christ. Children can get saved. So it's important to understand that. On the other hand, it's also possible that children can be deceived. All right? Let's go on to the other thing. Jesus, uh, how about Jesus? When he uh, preached this business of the gospel, the Bible says he preached, repent ye and believe the gospel. That's what the Bible says that he did. Or in other words, the Bible tells us that Jesus used the word. <gasps> Amen. He used the R word. He did use, he said, repent and believe the gospel. When speaking to small, speaking to small groups, uh, some came to him talking about the news of the day. Remember that in Luke chapter 13? They were present at that season, some that told uh, him of the Galileans. They thought they'd give Jesus a, an update on the news of the day. 
<laughs> the one that saw Nathan sitting under the fig tree, <laughs> you know, when he wasn't even around. I mean, but anyway, people don't get it sometimes. They came to Jesus and they wanted to update him on the news of the day. And he spoke of those Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Not sure what they were expecting Jesus to do about that. Maybe they're looking for him to lead a revolt. I don't know. But anyway, Jesus answered and said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Wow. He just threw it right at him. Unless you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You know, uh, just as, as something of an aside, but it's part of the message. Because I want to make a point. That's what, that's what preaching's about, isn't it? Making points. Let me make one. Later, Jesus is going to say, you know when your brother offends, uh, offends you, and you go to him, and he repents, then you forgive him. Right? He said, every time he repents, you forgive him. Every single time. Did Jesus mean something different about the word repent here than he did then? It's the same thing. When you confess, when, when somebody repents to you, what do you expect that means? If they say, I repent, what do you expect that means? That they've turned in something like true and sincere sorrow for what they've done and are not happy they did it, and want you to forgive them. And there is a kind of unwritten expectation that they're going to do what they can not to do it again. Isn't there? We get so impractical when it comes to theological things. I mean, just get real about this. Whenever, it's just in our own personal relationships. If, if, if I have offended somebody and I go to them and I say, I'm, I'm sorry I did that. That was wrong. I shouldn't have said that or I should, whatever it is. And I, I, I want you to forgive me. But I just want you to know that I have absolutely every intention of doing it again. <laughs> I'd just like you to know that. You need to be aware that I'm going to do it again and again and again and again. But I just like you to, you know, it's just silly. Now, I might do it again, but not because I want to or plan to or anything like that. You don't want to is the point. Amen. Anyway, so repent means repent means repent means repent. Wherever it's used, it means the same thing. Does it mean something different in some special case when it comes to repenting toward God? It means the same thing. It means anywhere else the word shows up in the Bible. But here he says, I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Jesus wasn't afraid to use the word. And let's look at some case studies here. Here's the man that was snared by riches. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. I'm trying to go for uh, something of, a, of, of a, you know, scenarios in which you can kind of put yourself where you might see how this word is used or how this, this thing is done. Jesus had people come by and talk to him about the news of the day. He took it around over there to a sermon on repentance. That's interesting, isn't it? He goes straight to, unless you repent, you'll also likewise perish. Hmm. And so here's a case study of a fellow who was trapped or snared by riches. Mark chapter 10, beginning of verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And there's not one person I know in the, in the so-called free grace movement who wouldn't immediately say, repeat this prayer after me. Am I right? right. Of course. What? Wow. Yeah. Well, do you know your sin or do you then, you know, Jesus died for you? They just run him through it right. real quick and then pray this prayer. Yes, sir. That's not what Jesus did. Amen. Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one. That's God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. We do not have patience for this kind of soul winning. <laughs> we just don't. Let's just get to it, man. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. Pray this prayer. I use the Romans road often. I think it's a good tool. But I think it's a bad habit. It's a very bad habit because it causes you to go into automatic mode and run people through a system right. instead of actually dealing with that center that's in front of you right there, right then.
Jesus did it differently. He threw the law at him. The law was given to be a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. You ever read that bit in the Bible where the Apostle Paul reveals that the point of the law is that is to show the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Now, God is the ultimate soul winner. Nobody is more interested in saving souls than the one who gave his son on the cross that they might be saved. Nobody. But when a sinner came to God manifest in the flesh and knelt down in front of him and said, I want to inherit eternal life, Jesus worked him. Yeah, that's right. Worked with, you know what I mean? Okay, let's start with the law. Right. <laughs> he, he lays the law on the guy. Now, I think Jesus Christ is like really smart. And maybe he has an advantage over us. I know I can almost hear somebody saying, wow, well, you're talking about Jesus. He, he has an advantage over us. I'm going to get on you about that in a minute. But you'll have to wait for it. But Jesus Christ is approaching this from the perspective of uh, omniscience. Jesus is dealing with this from a perspective of that one who could see Nathan sitting under, or Nathaniel sitting under the fig tree. You, you get my point here. So he definitely has an advantage, and I believe that Jesus Christ picked exactly which commandments to throw at this guy because I think Jesus knew what he was going to say. You ever notice he picked certain ones, and he went over others? I can imagine that guy, he's listening, he's, he's maybe tensing up a little bit. Well, Jesus picks, well, this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. He goes, Whew, those are ones I've done. I'm good. The Bible says Jesus looked at him and loved him. You ever notice that? You see, Jesus had been watching this guy for a long time. The Lord's been watching him since he was a little baby. In fact, Jesus was there when he was being shaped in the womb. Jesus chose the color of this boy's eyes. He said, no, genetics did that. Uh, Jesus did that. Yeah. Jesus shaped him in the womb. He shaped his little nose. He, he, had, uh, he was involved in the, in the, uh, you know, in the or, origin of this little boy's life. Been watching him his whole life. And Jesus knew that this is a young man who has really aspired to be a good boy. And so he puts the commandments in front of him that Jesus knew he had he had obeyed. Now, you and I would say, why didn't Jesus hit him with the one he didn't obey to bring him right to conviction right away? Jesus is a really good soul winner. He knew exactly where he was going and what this was all. He knew where this was going. And so this fellow says just exactly what Jesus knew he would say. This is so beautiful. And Jesus looked at him, and the Bible says Jesus loved him. Now, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, who served believed in Him, and so on. And, amen, uh, God committed His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. I mean, He loves everybody. But, so when the Bible says something like this, it means there was a moment of special affection. Jesus had a special affection for this man. He said, okay, you lack one thing. What's that? Now he's going to put his finger on it. Go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and follow me. <laughs> he couldn't do that. He was snared by his riches. Riches were the Lord of his life. He was under the bondage of of, of, that, of that issue. Jesus later says, how hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? This is interesting. We don't, I wish we had more time to kind of explore this. Because you, you, but I recommend when you're reading through these stories, stop and think about the ramifications of some of this stuff. Jesus uses this whole story to turn around finally and say to his disciples, you know, it's really hard for the rich guy.
So Jesus throws that at him. Go sell everything you have. This man, the Bible says, went away sorrowful. Sorrowful. He didn't, he didn't get, get angry. He didn't get, what? Yeah, but can't, forget that. No deal. That's not what he did. He went away sorrowful, but it was the wrong sorrow. It was a worldly sorrow. It wasn't that godly sorrow that works a repentance unto salvation. It was that worldly sorrow that he'll probably carry with him for the rest of his life. It was something he was not willing to do. Now the big question here to you and to me is, hey, babe, by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. What in the world is Jesus doing here? Hasn't he gone to soul winning classes? Doesn't he know his own gospel? Doesn't, he, doesn't Jesus know his own gospel? Doesn't Jesus know you don't buy your ticket to heaven? Well, you're like, yeah. So what's this about? This is tough for soul winners. Jesus watched him walk away. Just let him go. Now, I was taught you don't let anybody go without saying a prayer. That's what I was taught. Even if you just say, let me pray for you before you leave. You never let anybody go. You never let them just walk away. Much of wicked nonsense. Oh, I can't wait to get to the point of this message. Some of you think I'm there now, but I'm not. So this fellow walked away. Sorry. And Jesus let him go. I'm going to tell you something that wasn't easy for Jesus to do. It wasn't. Jesus looked on that man and loved him. And when he walked away, I believe Jesus was sorry too. And then he makes the statement about how hard it is for rich people to get saved. Of course, in Jewish culture, if you were rich, that meant you were favored by God and liked by God. If you're liked by God, man, that means you're kind of a step closer than the average guy. In that culture, that's what they believed. So when Jesus made that statement, the disciples went, whoa, well, then who can be saved? That was the question he was looking for from that young man. Who then can be saved? And then Jesus made the statement that was the point of the exercise. With men, it is impossible. What you're asking me for, young man, is something that is impossible for you. But with God, all things are possible. There's no way that Jesus Christ was saying the cost today is go sell everything you have. Right. And then a few days later, he said, we're going to have a blue light special with Zacchaeus. Right. He's going to get in for half. <laughs> it's nonsense. Right. The point was, this man missed what Zacchaeus got. I'm glad you're hearing this because I can't wait to tell you what, it, what the really big thing is here that's coming up. Zacchaeus. Here's a fellow who is really curious about Jesus. You know the story. It's a beautiful story. Luke chapter 19. He got himself, he's a little guy, short, short stature. He got himself in a tree so he can see Jesus coming by. Jesus walks right up to him and says, essentially he says, you're on my calendar. Now, the very important point with regard to soul winning. You're on my calendar. He didn't say those words, but he said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to have lunch at your house today. He must needs pass through Samaria. We'll look at that story in a little bit. There was a certain woman he knew was going to show up at a certain time of day. And there he was. He had an appointment. See, I must needs go. You understand? Okay. So Jesus says to Zacchaeus, I'm going to have dinner in your house. And they go to his house. And this guy's excited. And, and somewhere in all of this, we don't even see it happen. But somewhere in all of this, Zacchaeus is saved. 
that Jesus didn't even take him through the Romans road. Amen. What happened here? But somewhere Zacchaeus got saved, as Brother McCracken would say. Putting the emphasis on the past tense, amen? That's what he's doing with that. But anyway, saved. And he stands up. Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, and if I've defrauded anybody, I'm going to restore them fourfold. And Jesus said something really interesting. He said, this day. You understand? Look, here's what I'm getting at with this. It isn't the case, as you might read it, that Zacchaeus had gotten saved before? No, but he had repented before. Follow this, because you, you read it carefully, you'll see that what Zacchaeus is reporting is not that what I'm going to do from now on, he was stating and declaring his new policy. Good. Say, here's the way I do things now. I'm selling half my goods, giving them to the poor. Now, I don't know when that happened in Zacchaeus' life. Somewhere earlier, that developed in Zacchaeus' life. He came to a place where his conscience smote him, and he got to thinking about things, no doubt, maybe thinking of things he learned as a child. We can spend too much time on that kind of stuff. Let's just get right to the point. At some point, he had come to a place where he said, I, this isn't right. What I'm doing is not right. I need to make this. I need to do right. And he had an interest and a curiosity in Jesus. And when Jesus came into his house, apparently he believed on him from his heart and believed who he was and accepted and received him as Messiah and Lord. I know all of that because that's what the Bible says you got to do to be saved. Is it okay if I bring some insight from other scriptures to help me with a story like this? Does anybody object to that? Are we are supposed to assume that every single detail of every story is present in every story of the Bible? No, we, we, we are supposed to understand these things from the context of Scripture's revelation. The point of this story being in our Bible is so that we can do what we're doing tonight with it. That's why it's there. It's not there because we're just having a little historical anecdote about Jesus' life. Isn't this interesting? No, it's there to teach us. We're supposed to learn from it. That's why the Holy Ghost picked it and put it in here. So we're looking at this story and we're bringing to, with us to our understanding of the story what we know about the gospel, what we know the Bible says. And so what we, there are certain things we're going to assume. And there's a reason the Holy Spirit put it this way. It's because, you know what, sometimes things are going on in somebody's heart that you don't know about. So somewhere in this guy's life, probably recently, he came to a time of repentance in his life, but he wasn't saved. Salvation showed up that day. This day has salvation come to this house. Salvation didn't come the day he made the decision, I'm going to sell half my goods and give and restore people fourfold. Salvation came the day after he repented that he believed on Jesus Christ. Today, salvation just showed up in this house. Salvation doesn't come into a house when a man decides to clean up his life. Salvation doesn't come into a man's heart or life or house because he's decided that it's time to get my act right. It's time to start doing right. I got to clean up my act. That's not when salvation comes. Did I get you ready for it? Did I get you ready for it? That puts you on the path. That's that moment of turning around. You're heading the right direction now. You're moving toward it. But you won't be saved until you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The woman at the well. Another case study. John chapter 4. This woman at the well. It's amazing. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. Jesus Christ is working with her. He opens the conversation. Now, this is a beautiful soul winning pattern here for us. He initiated the conversation. He starts developing her interest. You know, if you want some water that'll really be great, you know, drink mine. I got some water for you. And this kind of thing. And it's a great, great soul winning study of how to go about it. 
But the point in this story that I want to bring out is that there was this moment when she says, give me this water that I may drink it and never thirst again. And Jesus said, bow your head and repeat after me. That's what we would do. What Jesus said was, go get your husband. Go get my husband. What does that have to do with anything? We're talking about water. All of a sudden, you want me to go get my husband? Go get your husband. Why? I don't have a husband. You just spoke the truth. You don't have a husband. In fact, you've had five. And you're shacking up with somebody right now. Now, he didn't use that language, but that's what he said. The fellow you're living with right now is not your husband. Now she looks at him a little differently. Oh, I perceive you're a prophet. So let me ask you a theological conundrum. And Jesus said, we don't talk about that right now. Let's just bow your head and pray. <laughs> you okay? This is how we're trained to do it. Oh, that's a good question. We'll get to it later. But right now, right? That's not what Jesus did. Jesus answered her question. He answered it. She raised uh, an issue of prejudice. He answered that. We're so anxious to get in the bow of the head and price we can go on to the next door. Help us. Exactly right. Get another notch in our belt and go tell everybody, led one to Christ today. Right. Careful with that. Oh, I want to say it right now. I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to say it right now. The Holy Ghost is the one leading them. Right. You're just a tool. Right. You're just a vessel where He shows up. Right. Holy Spirit's the one leading them. Amen. Holy Spirit's the one doing all this. Right. So I am going to leap over some things and, and get on to the, uh, uh, to the main point of this message and uh, I'm talking about the thief on the cross. There are several other great illustrations, but I'm going to go right to uh, the heart of the point that I believe the Holy Ghost wants me to make. In all of these stories, not one time to hear Jesus say, you got to repent and believe. Hello? Now, you should say that when it's appropriate to say that. But you can say that, and that means nothing if you're not doing that. You get it? It's not about say this word. It's about that's the way this is done. Go about getting there. You, you with me? Yeah. Just because you say the word repent, it could very well be they don't have a clue what you're talking about. But that fella knew exactly what Jesus was talking about when he said, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come follow me. He got that. Well, that woman was so, go get your husband. He didn't say, repent of your shacking up. He didn't say that. Now, he could have, and there's a time to say that. But he didn't. He said, go get your husband. He's working repentance in their heart. Just because you throw the word at him, that doesn't mean you're getting it done. Hello? Right. Good. Now, you might need to use the word. That's fine. Don't misunderstand me. Jesus certainly wasn't afraid to use it. That's why I started the sermon the way I did. He had that group in front of him tell him news of the day, you better repent. Or you're likewise. He used the word. Did I make that clear? I did that on purpose so I can get here and I wouldn't get people looking at me funny. He used the R word, amen. Right. But more importantly, he went for that. In his soul when he went for that. He went for repentance. When he saw it in Zacchaeus. And then saw that faith coming with it. Jesus said, glory. It just showed up. Here in this house. Good. Amen? Amen? Isn't that what you want? Amen. Then learn to be patient. It's not a hustle. You're not hustling people into heaven. If you're hustling them, you're hustling them only to one place. That's hell. You've got to be.
be under the control and leading of the Holy Spirit of God and let me go there and be done. The power you need to be effective in your soul winning is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Let me tell you something right now. You are not going to be an effective soul winner apart from the power of the Holy Ghost working in and through your life. See, here's what's happened. We've become salesmen rather than soldiers. You've heard me preach that one. People have become marketers of the gospel and they think it's their job to lead a person to Jesus to get saved. And that's been emphasized. I mean, I mean, people have preached that hard. It's your job to lead them to Jesus. I know Andrew brought folks to Jesus and all that kind of stuff. And yes, amen, amen, amen. But Andrew didn't say, bow your head and repeat after me. Not that you don't ever say that. But I don't like it. I don't like it because I want them to bow their head and I want to listen to what they say. Sure. I wonder what's going on in that heart. I don't want to put it there. I want to see if it's there. Right. Good. That's very important. Anyway, first you've got to have the power of the Holy Ghost upon your life. The second thing is you need to understand that as a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit is more interested in what's going on in that moment than you could possibly be. Yeah. He's got more invested. A whole lot more invested. Yeah. When, that, when that little fellow was conceived in the womb, Jesus lighted him, anticipating the day I'm going to save him. He lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He took his little measuring cup, dipped it into the bag of faith. I'm going to get slammed for that. <laughs> you know I'm just trying to make a point here. But he gave him the measure of faith. I'm going to put this little measure in there right now. Pop. That's for me. Later on in this boy's life, I'm going to come to that faith. I'm going to join the seed of the word to that faith. I'm going to make a new child. I'm going to make a new born again baby in Jesus. Yeah, you got to understand that's what's on his mind. God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It is not God's desire, will, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Father in heaven sent his Son to die for every single man in all the world, every woman, every child. He covered them all because he wanted to save them all. He lighted them all because he wants to save them all. He gave the measure of faith to all of them because he wants to save all of them. Jesus wants to save every sinner you meet. And he was after them a long time before you showed up. There were hundreds of moments when their conscience smote them that was the Holy Ghost reproving them. The Spirit of God moving this way, that way, another way. The Spirit of God going after sinners all over all the time. I'm telling you, and I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. Every sinner that goes to hell goes to hell fighting God all the way. God's been trying to get in that guy's way all his life. We need to wake up to that and labor together with God in this. You don't go so winning for God. You go so winning with him. Man, that's important. Amen. We're laborers together with God. The Holy Spirit was appealed to to assist the church in their work. In the old days, we don't even talk about Him helping us anymore in so many places. We do at our church, but in so many. Acts chapter 4, 30, 31. They already got the Holy Ghost come upon them, and I guess they had a leak because they cut, by the time you come to Acts chapter 4, they got to get filled again. Now let me tell you something, you got a leak. You're constantly leaking. That's why you need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. This is important. If you're going to be an effective soul winner and not, and not some effective salesman, 
then you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit was active leading the evangelist Philip. It was the Spirit of God who said, Philip, time to leave this active ministry. I got a fellow over there reading the Bible. I need someone to talk to him. Now, I'm just paraphrasing, but you understand the story. You've read it. And Philip was carried by the Holy Ghost to go forward and go find this one fellow sitting there reading his Bible. Personal evangelism, amen. Taking precedent over exciting revival. That's how interested Jesus is in saving these people. That's just amazing to me. Boy, get a hold of this. See it, see it, see it. The Holy Ghost is trying to win that person to Christ you're talking to. And so he goes over this fellow. He leads him to, he leads him to the Lord, as it were, in the, the vernacular that we use. But really, God led him to the Lord. You know what's really fun is when you get to be there when Jesus saves somebody. That's awesome. And you get to watch him do it. If you just be patient and not be mechanical and decide, here's the way it's supposed to be done, this verse, then this verse, then this verse, and not even paying attention to them. The Holy Spirit was, was active calling missionaries, Acts 13, verses 1 to 3. The Holy Spirit of God was active in directing these missionaries. You can go here, Paul, but not here. You're not going to go there. No, not there, not there, but go here instead. You, you get my, the Holy Spirit is all over this stuff. And some Yahoo some time back said, God's all done with it. He's done everything he's going to do. You go take care of the rest. That's just a lie. You need to come under the influence of the Holy Spirit and be used by him. So let me conclude like this. Just, you know, a couple of little illustrations. And these are just moments where it was like really neat. There's hundreds of these, you know, but there's just this, these are a couple that I use a lot because it was just, it was just so neat. <laughs> I go to visit a lady named Emma. She was a gypsy. I mean, we're talking crystal ball, turban, chains, the works. I worked with gypsies for about three, three and a half years. And we baptized 400 gypsies during that time. Yeah, it was amazing. God did a great work among gypsies. I'll tell you that story some other time in, in, in this more detail, but she was one of them, and I remember the day she got saved. It was glorious. I was preaching, and I'm watching her. And she got saved sitting in her pew. I see that a lot. I remember one time I went and visited a lady who had been coming to our church for a while, and I, I, her name was Mary Eberly, and uh, it was just one of those situations where I, I, I couldn't get to her. I finally got to her, sat down with her. I went through the gospel. She goes, oh, I did that. Yeah, I remember that. Well, really, when did you do that? Oh, uh, three Sundays ago. Three Sundays ago? Oh, and she told me, yeah, I was sitting in church. You preached. You said this. I did it. So why didn't you come forward during the invitation? Why should I? I did it. I'm serious. And that's the way I handle the invitation. So people would do that in my preaching. That is something that would happen. And uh, so anyway, uh, I, I watched Emma get saved sitting in her pew. I just watched it happen. Becky would help me with the invitation so she could take care of the ladies. So she'd come forward. Sometimes we watch these gypsies walk the aisle, and she and I both would look at each other, and we'd say, it just happened. On the way down the aisle, you can see it in their face, and their countenance, boom. And then we talk to them, and we verify, of course, and so on. Anyway, I come into Emma's house because she had missed church. It was very unusual for her to miss church. I'm sitting down and visiting with her, just asking if you're sick, are you sick, everything okay. She had a friend with her sitting over here. Some of you have heard this story. And I sat down between her friend and Emma, and Emma, and I'm talking to Emma and, and meeting her friend. Oh, yeah, that's nice to meet you. And, da, 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 da. and I thought maybe I'll get a chance to win her to Christ. You know, you know, you know how it is? Because I'm a soul winner. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I don't know why I said it. I said, uh, it, it, this is so weird, too. I want to I back up. I want you to get this. I'm sitting there, and the thought kept coming to mind. Come unto me, ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That verse came to my mind. And I looked at Emma. Was that verse in my mind? I looked at her. And I'm thinking, why is that verse coming to my mind? Oh, well, we talk a little while. Come unto me, ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Boom, hit me again. So you know what I did? I just looked kind of straight ahead. I said, come unto me, ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That's what I did. That woman fell apart. She just began boo-hoo. I mean, she just completely fell apart. And Emma said, oh, pastor, just before you came in, she was telling me all her troubles. 
all her burdens. Isn't that something? The yeah, the Lord knew. It, the Lord is the soul winner. Amen. We look at these stories of Jesus, well, he had an advantage. Now, you've got that advantage. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you're walking after the Spirit of God, and you're not walking in the flesh. You're not trying to be a salesman. You're not trying to, uh, you know, manipulate people and talk them into saying some kind of a prayer. You're there to actually be what Jesus envisioned you would be, a vehicle through which His Holy Ghost would flow, like a river of living water where thirsty souls could get a drink. Let's stand together, please. Now, I know, you probably feel it too, we just got started. <laughs> but I'm going to encourage you to take it from here. You got the main idea. You go into all those stories, you look at them, you'll see it. The very one that we look at, Jesus Christ our Lord, He, the Savior, the one who died for them, is with you. He's there. And he cares about them. And he will help you. He'll help you see it. I've been walking up to a group of boys. They were all had been playing and everything. I walked and they gathered to me. And I started preaching to them. And there were about four of them, and really three of them were mocking me, laughing at me. And for some reason I said because I'd been memorizing this verse, and I don't know why, I just, I just said, you know, if you lift up your voice for understanding and cry, now, now I can't quote the verse, but it's in Rome, it's in Proverbs 4. Thou shalt let, seek her for treasure, and search for it for hid treasure. Then you'll understand the fear of God, and find the knowledge of God. This, this younger boy over here literally went, I cry out! I don't know why he did that. I don't know why. But obviously that boy got saved, got baptized, came into our church. The other three, little scorners, they went on their way. I tell you, this is real. What I want you to get a handle on is you don't go knocking on doors like a salesman, like a fuller brush salesman or Amway salesman. And you're just, you know, it's all by the numbers, you know. You knock 100 doors, you get three people to talk to you, you get 10 people to talk to you. you get That is a bunch of nonsense. Amen. You go out there filled with the Holy Ghost and watch what Jesus will do. And by the way, there are many days Jesus walked through town, nobody got saved. He watched more than one walk away. You've got to be willing to let them walk away. And I need to be quiet and let you respond to God. Let's do it. Respond to God, church. Just however the Spirit of God has spoken to you, you speak back to Him.